Welcome to this webinar uh, presented to the African Young Water Professionals Forum on the 2nd of June 2022, uh, sponsored by ICID and ACR. Now, after I gave this webinar, I got so many requests to put a recording up. People said that I went too fast or uh, their internet dropped out or they missed a slide. So here is a slightly shorter version of the webinar. Uh, it's called Combining Pharma and Science-Based Knowledge Through the Virtual Irrigation Academy. And this was uh, a webinar to kick off um, our online training course called the VIA Water School. This is the home page of the Virtual Irrigation Academy, www.via.farm. Uh, and our purpose, empowering irrigators through simple technology and people-centered learning. Well, let me give you a short history of the VIA. Uh, we started as a research project back in 2015, working in four sub-Saharan African countries, Malawi, Tanzania, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, uh, funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research. Now, the BIA combines monitoring and learning and governance of water for irrigation. Uh, our focus is smallholder irrigators in low to middle income countries. Now, I'm gonna say a lot more about monitoring, learning, and governance. Monitoring is, is, is relatively easy. Lots of people make sensors that can take a reading. Learning is much more difficult. What do farmers do with this information? And governance of water is the huge challenge we have, no matter whether we're talking smallholder or big commercial irrigation. Governance of water is uh, something that we've struggled to do well. Uh, now, uh, I'll say some more about this at the end, but uh, we went from a research project to a not-for-profit company, uh, and that opens up all kinds of opportunities for us. Let me start with what we mean by people-centered learning. So we have sensors, here they are, uh, buried in the ground uh, with a wire coming from them. And that sensor is plugged into a reader and that reader actually has output as color. Uh, there's a very simple reader, which we'll, I'll show you a bit later. It looks just the size of a credit card. And we do more than just measure soil water, we measure uh, what's in the water, the solutes, and these here are wetting front detectors, and we measure um, salt here and nitrate with color test strips. So the output from these tools is a color pattern. Three layers that relate to water at the top, middle, and bottom of the root zone, and then we show the nitrate or often the salt readings underneath. Uh, because water, salt, and nitrate are all linked, and you need to see them together. But here we have the Chameleon Wi-Fi system, which is what we call an array of sensors, one, two, three, in the top, middle, and bottom of the root zone. And there's also a temperature sensor and a unique identification number that goes with each array. And this can be permanently connected to one of the readers, which will uh, download a reading every two hours to a Wi-Fi access point if there is one in range. Now, it's much more likely uh, in your field that uh, you don't have a Wi-Fi access point. And in that case, you can come along with your mobile phone uh, and turn on your hotspot and the data uh, will just be downloaded. Uh, two hourly intervals. But even more likely is this third example where you have many arrays. You might have 20 on a scheme or more, and you go from array to array, plug it into the reader. Uh, each array of sensors has a unique identification 
So the data is just picked up and stored on the reader and then you can transmit it with your mobile phone up to the BIA uh, data platform. Well, here are the key features of the chameleon sensor and most importantly, it measures what the plant experiences. We don't measure soil water content, we measure tension like a tensiometer. This means that the blue, green or red reading has the same meaning whether you're in a sandy soil or a clay soil. We give the output as colors. Uh, blue for wet soil, green for moist, red for dry. So the colors have meaning and they are thresholds for action. And when we show data, we don't show graphs, we show patterns. And you will be amazed how smallholder irrigators can interpret the patterns from their own fields. So these patterns are visualized on the BIA platform. And we'll talk more later about making decision, decisions, not just at uh, your field scale, but actually at much higher scales like, like whole of scheme management. And here we have a closer look at the chameleon sensor. Now, to those of you familiar with these sensors, it looks a bit like a gypsum block. Uh, it is not a gypsum block, but uh, it does have gypsum on the outside here. And the gypsum is actually buffering against uh, salt in the soil. But the real trick is this material on the inside here, this sensing material between two electrodes and the special properties of this material uh, amplifies the soil tension signal in the soil. Um, and that means that this sensor can be quite inexpensive, but it can also be uh, very accurate. Uh, and here on the right, we have the three sensors in the ground and connected to the reader. And here is a very simple uh, chameleon soil water pattern. Uh, you will remember there are three lights on the reader and each light is represented by a layer in the pattern. In this case, 20, 40 and 60 centimeters. So here we see blue at all three depths and then we see each depth turning green sequentially and then red. And this uh, is uh, an example of a drying soil with the roots slowly taking out water with depth and going from wet to dry. So this is a, a, a sim perhaps the simplest chameleon pattern you can see. And if you irrigate it here, then you would get blue. And the point is, it shows you very easily when you need to irrigate, how deep your roots are, and when I irrigate, well, how deep will my water actually go? The chameleon card is an even simpler version of the same technology. You have uh, the sensors buried in the ground as before, but now you just drop the wires in these slots here, one wire in each slot, and the light will come on. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, the wires have been dropped into the slots. This is just a credit card sized reader and the light is green. Now this instrument doesn't store data or it doesn't uh, send it to the website, but it gives a farmer a really quick answer to whether they should irrigate or not. We don't only measure soil water, uh, we measure the solutes, in other words, what's in the water. And this here is a wetting front detector that's buried in the root zone. So imagine irrigating, and here's the water coming down into the soil. Now, if you put a little water on, then you will wet a shallow depth. Um, but if you put a lot of water on here, then you'll irrigate a deeper depth. So imagine a uh, the water coming down and when it hits the funnel it gets caught in the funnel and we converge the flow lines 
and we focus the water to the center. So we get a water sample here and the wind front detector makes a, uh, pops up a, a flag. Uh, and then the water that's been caught can be removed with a syringe and placed on a nitrate test strip and the salt can be measured. And this information becomes really critical for irrigation management, as we will see soon. Well, here is another shot of a, of a wetting front detector. Uh, here you can see it's a it's a funnel that's buried and then it has this indicator above the soil surface. So when it's buried in the in the soil, if the water goes down that far, well, this one will pop its indicator up, but this one uh, does not. Its indicator stays down because it doesn't catch a water sample. And here on the right are the test strips, the nitrate test strip here and a salt meter that also reads by color. Uh, simply because colors are very easy to interpret and nobody can ever remember what the numbers actually mean. And now we are ready to put it all together. Here we have the soil water pattern with layer one, two and three. So we see wet soil on top and then dry. And then there's an irrigation here and that uh, turns the red to blue. But the shallow wetting front detector has picked up a water sample. And we put that onto the test strip and we find out we've got very high nitrate and that pops up there as a, a purple circle. Uh, we measure the salt and we see we've got green, we've got very low salt. Uh, then the plant uses some water and we turn green and then we irrigate again. And now we get a water sample from the shallow detector. We've got two in the ground, but we've just picked up water from the shallow one. And now we've got a bit less uh, nitrate. And we can assume that that nitrate went up into the plant because it's dry here. So there wasn't leaching of nitrate. Now it's very important to know that nitrate uh, is very mobile in the soil. It doesn't stick to soil particles. The nitrate travels with the water. So when you overwater, you wash it out of your soil. Um, but we see here now that the salt has gone up a bit. We're now in the yellow zone. This is just an illustration, of course. And then we uh, irrigate again, and this is a big irrigation. The water goes right down to the bottom, and we see that we push some nitrate down, and we push the salt down. We've now got two readings because we've picked up water from deep and shallow wetting front detectors. Um, and we can see what has happened to our water and we can also see what's happened to our solutes. I'm returning to our theme of monitoring and learning. Monitoring is relatively easy. You just take a reading and you irrigate if you think the soil isn't wet enough. Uh, lots of people do that. But for a smallholder farmer, what happens if there's not enough water or you can't get water when you need it? Or you have to choose between a high quality and a low quality water source? What happens if you're worried about leaching your fertilizer or you're wondering whether you should flush your salt? How deep are your roots? How much water should you put on at one time? Can you skip this irrigation and wait for the next one? These are all questions that irrigators face every day. And the only way to answer them is to keep learning. A bit of trial and error, uh, look at your pattern, try something new, what does your pattern say, and slowly understand how your own farm works, how each crop and season and irrigation method unfolds. So learning is really critical and the course is going to take you through a bit of learning theory, which is up here on the right. Uh, single loop learning is just actions and consequences. Irrigate, wet, irrigate, wet. But our real challenge is governance. If we don't get the governance right, eventually everything else falls apart too. We want to have, well, for a smallholder scheme, uh, it's built to get equitable 
and sustainable and productive use of water. And so uh, by working out our governing values, why are we doing this? We can then uh, come to our governing assumptions, which will take us down to our actions and consequences. This is called triple loop learning, and it's not easy. Well, now you have to take a, a deep breath because we're going to go into something um, a bit more difficult. Um, we're going into, into data analytics. Uh, this is something we're really just developing. And it's about uh, making decisions at higher scales than just a single field. We're moving towards governance here. So on the left hand side, we have a chameleon pattern. We've looked at these before. This is a real pattern from a green maize crop. And we can see the blue to green to red and then irrigating and going blue again. And this is the, the normal kind of wetting and drying we might see in any field. Now what we can do is we can integrate all the area of blue and we find we've got 29% and we can integrate all the green and we've got 41% and we can integrate the red by area and we've got 30% is red. What this means is we can summarize this whole season, this whole crop in one point on a diagram here. If you think of a, uh, if you remember back to a sand, silt and clay uh, diagram in soil science, this is a little bit similar. You plot 29% uh, green, that's up here. And then you plot 41%, uh, sorry, blue, you plot the blue, and then you plot 41% green, which is along here, and you plot 30% red, which is here. And the size of that dot is related to the yield. So if we look at the second pattern here, the middle pattern, we see it's got clearly much more blue, uh, a lot less green, uh, and less red too. And it's a 54, 23, 23 pattern, and it plots here. So it's wetter, the dot is the same size, so the yield isn't any higher, but it's in a different part of the triad. It's much closer to the blue corner. And finally, we get to this pattern here, which is clearly very dry, it started off wet, and there's been an irrigation event here or two to get some blue, but it doesn't stay blue for long. It gets very red, and in fact, this red hatching is so dry, the sensors uh, aren't recording. And uh, of course, this is now 59% red and it plots towards the red corner and the small dot means small yield. Now, what this allows us to do is to take many crops, often the same type of crop grown at the same time on the same scheme, and show them relative to each other on a triad diagram. And here we have some real data from an irrigation scheme in Malawi. And uh, what we see is that in the 2016 year, uh, there are, these are all maize crops, I think, and uh, they all plot down here in the blue corner. But you can see that a bit later, 2018 and 2019, the farmers are choosing to irrigate less. They are moving away from the blue corner. They have more green and they have more red in their patterns, but most importantly, the yields are going up. Now we're going to take a step closer to this elusive idea of irrigation governance. Moving from just do I irrigate today or not, to how well is a whole scheme performing over a whole year. And we have all the crops we looked at on the previous slide here from three different years plotted. And what we see is that in the first year, most crops plot in this very, very wet zone, what are just the, the, the area that's shaded purple, and we see it here 
in 2016, about 70% of all fields on this scheme are very wet and a smaller number are wet and a tiny number are kind of moderately wet. So we could say from this that a lot of water is being used on this scheme. But the green and the purple relate to later years, 2017 and 18. And when we look at these later years, we find farmers have moved out of the very wet into the wet and into uh, the moderately wet. So farmers have chosen themselves to use less water and at the same time their yields have gone up. Uh, now we're not quite sure why, it might be they've just got more time to do other tasks when they're not irrigating, it might be that uh, they're not leaching out their, their nutrients. Now I'm going to take you through a quick case study, this one from Malawi, um, a master's student Jonah Chikankerni did this comparing uh, four irrigation schemes, uh, one, two, three, four, with um, the nearby research station. Um, and what we see here, we're looking at yields, and we see on the research station, the maize yields are between six and seven tons per hectare. But when we look at the schemes, each of the dots here relates to uh, the yield, the blue dots to the first year with equipment and the red dots to the second year. So we see that in the first year, the red, the blue dots, uh, the farmers are getting around one ton per hectare of maize, sometimes a bit more. Um, but these are very, very low yields. Um, in the second year, things are better. The red dots, uh, much higher yields farmers are getting. Um, but um, still not as good as the research station. Well, what's going on here? We have two patterns. This one is year one, this one's year two. And we see very clearly all this wet soil that the only time that the soil dries out really is once at the beginning and at the very end when the crop's being ripened for harvest. Now, irrigations are happening all through this period, and we can imagine that there's lots of leaching of fertilizer. The second pattern below it uh, shows that the soil has been allowed to dry out between each irrigation event. You can see the farmer waits for it to go red before irrigating each time. Um, and this gave a much higher yield. Now, th this is one farmer, but let's take all 20 farmers from the scheme. What we then find is that in year one here, the, the 20 patterns average 60% blue and 30% red. But in the second year, they averaged about 45% blue and much more red. Again, these farmers are choosing to use less water. And if I jump over to the, the bottom left here, this is the average gross margin in the second year, uh, nearly a thousand US dollars per hectare. And this is the gross margin of the year before. Um, you can't run an irrigation scheme with such small gross margins as is shown in this first year. Now, uh, What's really interesting is if you look at the input costs that these farmers spent growing their maize, almost all the cost is fertilizer. <laughs> and then there's some on seed and there is some on chemicals, this orange. And the red line on top is what the farmers are spending on water. Now, if water costs nothing, <laughs> People are going to use it if it's available. And when they use too much of it, they probably wash their fertilizer out. They get low yields and they get low gross margins. Well, that was just one scheme. So let's uh, zoom out even further. Here is some results from 1,270 farmers. Now we're getting into 
into the much bigger scale. And we asked these farmers how their yield changed after monitoring and seeing their color patterns. And what we see is that these farmers estimate these quite big yield increases. Uh, this is 0 to 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 100 or double. We see lots of farmers say their yield went up after they started to monitor. We also see quite a few farmers yields felt their yields had gone down. Now, why is that? Well, uh, on many schemes, farmers said they ran out of water. Many people had low use of inputs uh, and there were lots of problems with pests and disease. Just think full army worm. But that makes this even more fascinating. Even in the presence of all the constraints that we see on smallholder irrigation schemes of low inputs, pest and disease, running out of water, even in that situation, a, a vast majority of people increased their yields. And not only that, so many, 70% or more, said they saved water, saved time. And most interestingly of all, many farmers said that having the color patterns allowed them to manage conflict and to reduce conflict over water on the schemes. Knowledge co-creation. Researchers aren't the only people who create new knowledge. Now I've left this slide till late in the presentation because I didn't want to scare you off, but we'll deal with this in much more detail in the water school. But very quickly, how do researchers create knowledge? Well, they set up um, a scientific hypothesis of what we want to know compared to what we do know. And the work is done in a very controlled environment and aims to produce what we call universal knowledge, which means that if you do the same experiment that I did on the other side of the world, in the same way, using the same equipment, you should get the same answer. And when we do that, we publish our results. Now, because we believe this information is universal, we think it can be transferred to other people and we shove it to extension workers who shove it to farmers. But let's think about the farmer for a minute. We call this mode two knowledge production. And farmers don't create knowledge against hypotheses. They create, they have a, a local problem. They have a problem on their own farm that they're trying to deal with. And they're not looking for a solution from a research station. They're looking for implementable knowledge, useful knowledge, something that they can do, something that they can do now in all their constraints. And what they're looking for is something that simply works. Now, what this means is that farmers create knowledge differently from scientists. But we need to bring these two forms of knowledge together, which we do in the patterns uh, that we have been looking at before, where we can ask the farmer, why did you get a pattern like this? What pattern would you like? How could you change? And from a scientific perspective, we could say, well, this is the implications of this kind of pattern and what we think it means if you did something else. So this is really the heart of the VIA, linking the knowledge of the farmer and the researcher to come up with new ideas that maybe neither would have thought of before. And this is what the VIA does best of all. It unlocks the creativity on the farms that was always there. The farmers start to look at their results, talk about their results. Uh, the roots go deeper than I thought. I can obviously, that means you can lengthen the interval between irrigations. The soil looks dry but there is sufficient water below. That might be red on top, blue below. A very, very common mistake is to believe that the soil surface is a good indicator of when to irrigate. Too much water leaches the nutrients. We've seen that already in that. And that might be the greatest lesson uh, that has been learned across the, the hundreds of schemes we have worked at. And of course, if you don't uh, over irrigate, then you don't need to fight over water. 
So here we are at the BIA Water School. Um, I'm filming here in my garden. So why is this being done in a garden? Well, uh, it was COVID. We were all stuck at home. But there's a much bigger reason than that. The Water School is about experiential learning, not academic learning, where we lay out the theory topic by topic and then hope that someone some, at some stage can put it all together. What we do in the Water School is we go through uh, seven uh, episodes in my garden, plotting, uh, charting a whole year, and we look at all the problems that come up and how we deal with them. And only then do we delve into the theory behind how we can solve these problems. So the water school involves uh, uh, the garden video, it's a bit like a documentary, and then each episode is unpacked in a presentation like this one that go, takes you uh, deeper into the detail. Well, thank you for participating in the webinar. Uh, last week, we had over 140 people from 36 African countries. Uh, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the Water School. Please give us feedback. We want to make more courses and we want to keep making them better and better. Now, there was one uh, question that's been asked after the webinar and, 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 and by many of you since, which is, uh, what next? Uh, do we just try to get some sensors and ask farmers to buy them? Will, will that change things? And the answer is uh, probably not. The irrigation industry invests billions in concrete and canals. We subsidize water we subsidize power, we subsidize pumps, we subsidize pipes uh, and drip kits. But what we need to do most of all is to invest in learning. And if we invest in farmer learning, we will unlock a huge amount of creativity that's down there on the farm. When farmers start to monitor and collect data, they don't just collect it for themselves, uh, making better decisions of when to water, they collect data that can be used at higher scales to manage whole irrigation schemes better. So if you are investing in irrigation, then uh, we would love to work with you. Please get in contact with the BIA.